Hey guys, if you want to support my show, then you should think about joining my Patreon. At my Patreon, I offer all kinds of amazing perks in exchange for your financial support. From live streams of my interviews as they are happening, to bonus Q and A's, behind the scenes photos and videos of my shoots, plus cool merch like stickers, mugs, and hoodies, we have you covered. So go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered, and while you're at it, make sure that you click that subscribe button so you don't miss a single one of my new updates. So you ended up getting into camming and then how did you do in that world? Like how, after the initial, you know, first part, which you said was a little bit scary, um, did you find that you enjoyed camming after that and how frequently were you doing it? Yeah. I mean, like you have to understand for the context at this point, my expectation for my own life was incredibly low. I had been raised to expect to be a housewife to a, like a lower class guy. Um, and then when I lost my faith, I was like, maybe the best I can get is like a couple of promotions at a gas station manager type deal. Wow. Like that was like the peak of what I thought I was capable of. But like I hadn't conceived that I could do anything else uh, because like college was not an option for me due to finances. Um, so when I started camming and I made $60 the first night in a couple hours of work, I was this was like a life changing amount for me. I was like, holy shit, a whole new world is possible. And it was like so exciting for me that like I had like some sort of like very direct control over my ability to earn money um, that it just it, I threw myself into it wholeheartedly. I was camping as much as I could. I was having an incredible time with it. I tried a bunch of creative stuff. I this is where I learned to mime It's one night there was some mime face paint lying around because it was October and I dressed up as a mime and then did a show and they loved it. So I just kept doing it. And then I eventually accidentally got like pretty good as a, a sex mime specifically, like really good at making fake dicks and whatever. Um, so it was really wonderful. <laughs> that <is a> unique <laughs> talent. I love that. Oh my God. Um, and I was, I wasn't making that much, maybe like 80 to a hundred dollars an hour, which I mean, for me, that was spectacular. Yeah. Uh, I say not much now compared to how much I make now. <laughs> right. Um, and I did really well after I went to Sophia Locke's cam mansion, which is a mansion that I don't know if you know Sophia Locke, but she was a cam girl doing very, pretty well on the website, My Free Cams specifically. And then she hosted a mansion where a bunch of the girls came and lived in this mansion for like a week or so and filmed a bunch of content together. And it was like a publicity stunt. So I went and with all of these other girls and really good connections. They're really fantastic. And after that, my income hit around $200 an hour on average and maintained there for about five years. Wow. So what made you decide to make the switch to OnlyFans? And was it maybe like, uh, cause I, I remember when OnlyFans came along, I was like, Oh, I'll get my URL just cause so no one yeah. else takes it. But then I didn't take it seriously at all for years. Like I barely paid any attention to it. And then, you know, all of a sudden, like everyone was on OnlyFans and then I decided to really try it. And that changed a lot. So that was that kind of the same thing for you? Like yeah. you got on it and you're like, this is a side thing. And then, so what made you decide to like really throw yourself into it? Yeah. Like you, I signed up early on uh, 2017 and like nobody was really using it. And I made like, I don't know, $50. And I was like, I guess that's, it's not really worth my effort. But around that time I was getting burned out of camming. Um, and so a friend offered me a data analyst position at a crypto startup. So I joined that. Um, turns out it's not great. I don't like working a normal job for other people doing things that I, I personally don't care about. Uh, and also I wasn't making a ton of money. So um, at the end, 2018, at the end of 2018, I started doing physical in-person escorting because um, I was really burned out of camming. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was very fun in the beginning, but you know, I get kind of old. You have the same clients and you have to continually produce new material. I get very intensive. Um, so I was doing in-person sex work, which was really great. And I really liked it. And I did that for about a year and a half till COVID hit. And I was like, hmm, well, I don't want to kill my clients because uh, a lot of them are older. Uh, and also a lot of them just like don't want to see me because of COVID risk. So um, and that was right around the time OnlyFans was blowing up. So my friends were like, get on OnlyFans, decided to get on OnlyFans. And then within three months, I was making $100,000 a month amazing. So before we dive into that, because I know that you're like the resident expert on OnlyFans, um, I just want to talk about the escorting really quickly because, you know, that's something a lot of, a lot of sex workers do. A lot of people in the adult industry do performers, but a lot of people don't want to talk about it. But I have found that more people are being more and more open to, to talking about it. You know, it's been considered such a taboo thing for so long, but you're super open about it. So 
tell us a little bit about like maybe what were your clients like in general? Yeah. Uh, well, it, clients are dependent a lot on pricing. When I first started, I charged 800 an hour and then it gradually cre- increased it to 100, and, uh, sorry, 1200. And it, that's like, it seems like a small change in like the higher end, but even there, there was a difference in clientele versus the price. Um, so I'm not representative of the general population. I think the median in larger cities is like $500 or something an hour. Um, but mm-hmm. for me, they tended to be uh, higher end guys, um, lawyers, doctors, uh, successful writers, uh, TV show writer people, <laughs> um, architects, uh, sort of like the kind that had the, a, a disposable income that allowed them to see me. Mm-hmm. Usually, uh, average age um, 45. I, I tracked most of the data in a spreadsheet. Um, so you you did a spreadsheet of your clients and you like did a data. I, I yeah, love how, like, I, I you tracked data um, like the sex positions we had, their occupation, how attractive I found them, and how good I thought they were at sex. Who orgasmed? How many times? Um, how many times I saw them? How long the appointment was? The city it was in, stuff like that. Wow, you are a different kind of woman. That's amazing. So wait, did you reach any conclusions with all of this statistical data? <laughs> So unfortunately, I only started tracking like a, a part of the way through. So I have about 75 data points for, from 75 mm-hmm. appointments, um, which is like mm-hmm. good, but not enough to draw like very strong conclusions unless you have like a really strong correlation. Um, right. So I, I did find a, a weak suggestion that I tend to orgasm more with unattractive clients, which is interesting. Um and there's a lot of data, like, you know, how the frequency of sex positions. But I think that this is probably confounded by me as a person, like, depending on, like, what positions I, I sort of guided them to. So Right. Why do you think that you orgasm more with unattractive clients? Was it because they, they tried harder? Yeah, I think so. Oh, that's so <laughs> cute. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime I got a really attractive client, I was like, damn it. <laughs> All right, guys, you heard it straight from Ella's mouth. Okay. (laughs) Like you don't have to be hot to be a good lover. You've just like increased the confidence of so many guys watching this like tenfold. (laughs) So thank you for that. That's awesome. Um, and then, uh, what do you think people's biggest misconception about, um, that line of work is because there's, you know, there's a lot of stigma around that. I think even more so than performing, you know, in, in media. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stigmas and like some of it is like kind of true. Like most stereotypes are based to some degree on accuracy. Um, but I think that sort of is very grainy and misses a lot of very important nuance. Um, so for me, again, higher end. Um, but like I found that the majority of the clients, I would say 80% seem to genuinely care about my experience and my well-being. I'd say like roughly 20% seemed to just sort of be like, I felt very interchangeable for 20% of them. Like I could have been mm-hmm. any other body. They just wanted to like slam it, be done and, and sort of leave. And they were like, obviously mm-hmm. like, I'm paying for you. I expect to have a good experience. I'm going to sort of use you. Um, which was like fine. It's, a, like, it's an exchange that I'm voluntarily making. And I like, prefer having that exchange than not having it. Um, but probably 80% of them seemed to like actually really care about me. And that was really cool. And I feel like like most people sort of think about sex work is, and like the clients don't give a shit about the prostitute. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is absolutely not the case. Like men, like I didn't expect the degree that which like men really feel the need for some sort of emotional intimacy to be able to get satisfaction from the sex itself. It was really cool. That's amazing. Wow. And, and well, how long was your average appointment? Uh, I think like how many hours? 1.5 hours, I think was the average, maybe two. And so this kind of points to like an interesting fact about escorting. And I was talking about this with another guest recently was that you, the sex, so how long did the sex generally last? Like the sex itself? You know, I didn't track that, but like based on my memory, uh, I would say maybe 20 to 30 minutes. So that means that like, there's a good hour maybe where you guys aren't having sex. So what are you doing in that, in that time period? Talking usually. Um, yeah. like sometimes we'd go to dinner beforehand. The talk. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of guys liked it. And I also really preferred it when it was like set up like a date. Like I get to know the guy a bit beforehand. Um, mm-hmm. And then I just kind of feel like a slut, like the slut who like goes to dinner. And then it's like, I don't know, I guess I'll fuck this guy. She's like, I'm a little encouraged. <laughs> so it's pretty much just me in college, except I wasn't getting paid for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> yeah, I, you know, I've talked to a lot of other girls who've done full service sex work and and almost all of them had said, yeah, the majority of the time is spent talking. And a lot of these guys just want like a connection with somebody, but they don't necessarily have time for a girlfriend or mm -hmm. really the desire to have a girlfriend. They might travel a lot. And for them, it's like, you know, and it, an opportunity to experience an evening with a beautiful woman, you know, get what, you know, pretty much most guys are after when they go on a date with you and, um, you know, no strings attached. Don't have to worry about, you know, if they have to call her the next day and if she expects a relationship or something like that. So I don't know. I've always felt that like escorting makes so much sense to me. Um, and you know, I wish more people were kind of more understanding and open to that yeah. line of work. Cause I think it's, I think you guys honestly provide like a service to people. Yeah, out of the three um, forms of sex work that I've done so far, escorting felt to me to be the healthiest, both to me and the guys that I saw. It felt to be like the mm. most humanizing and the most intimate. And like, I, it felt like I was doing actually the most good for someone. I, I, it's right. strange to me that like escorting is so legally uh, suppressed compared to the others. Because um, like when people are so concerned about like the adverse effects, like what is this doing psychologically to our men and women? I'm like, well, if you like, I feel like the in-person stuff is the least likely to, to cause those adverse effects. So I wish that was more legalized or decriminalized rather. Really? It's, so it's interesting. So why do you think that? Do you think because that human connection like kind of bypasses, I don't know. Yeah. Explain to me, like, how, how do you mean by that? Yeah. It's, it's more organic or something. It's, uh, if I had to pull on an argument that like maybe might be used to justify other things I don't agree with. It would be, um, uh, it's like the, the oldest, it's like very old. It's a uh, very traditional. We haven't, it hasn't been modified by technology. Um, like only fans is something it's like an abnormal type of experience that could only be caused in 2021 ish. Um, and it's very asymmetric. You have like a lot of men viewing one woman and the men are separated from each other. Like there's no way that this could, this is like playing on psychology in like really novel ways. And we don't know the impacts of that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. Like we have to, we have to go with tech. Uh, we have to roll with the punches, not against them. Um, but, but if we're going for like optimizing for psychological health, I would say that it uh, seems like the older, more sustainable thing probably feels better. What are some of the main differences between camming and OnlyFans? So I know that you now are pretty much, I think, exclusively OnlyFans, right? You're not doing camming anymore. Correct. Um, I understand that monetarily you're doing much better on the OnlyFans platform. Um, but you've talked before in pre uh, previous interviews about how there's actually like more of a um, personal connection that guys actually feel with you on OnlyFans versus camming. How can you explain how that works? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's like an interesting psychological difference. So for camming is on um, my free cam specifically, you sort of broadcast live to an audience. The audience can see you um, and they all type in a chat room and this is how you interact with them. You sort of, me as a performer, like watches a chat on my screen where like guys are entering in words and all the guys sort of can talk to each other as well. Um, when people give me money as a tip, this is displayed to the entire chat. Um, and then it makes a large sound. I react to visibly to all of the other men collectively. So the kind of psychological world that this creates is uh, like very hierarchical. Um, it, it is even amplified by really high earners on my free camps who take like the top tippers of each month or whatever, and then rank them very publicly on their uh, profile page. So, so you're, the men are entering into a very visible, very aggressive hierarchy where you climb up the hierarchy and you beat the other men by giving the woman more money. Um, and women deliberately use this. And in, in my cam girl guide, I, I advise using this competition um, because like men are not just tipping to make you feel happy. They're tipping to also make you feel happy in front of all of the other men. So this is sort of like a status mm -hmm. display. Um, and the thing that this results in is that you get a sort of, you know, this sort of distribution of tippers where a very small percentage of men uh, make the majority of the tips. Uh, so you, most people, most, I did like a very early survey. It wasn't like a great survey, but preliminary data indicated that the majority of girls had about 80 to 90% of their income come from under five men, which is just absolutely insane. And um, this yeah. has pros and cons. Uh, this means that very wealthy men are attracted to this platform because they can use it to dominate all of the other men. Um, so so this is like a certain psychological profile. Uh, OnlyFans does a completely different thing. And when OnlyFans first started up, I thought it was going to fail because it was failing 
to to trigger those same points, those same psychological points that my free cams did or other campsites. Um, the OnlyFans deliberately like removes the men from each other. The men don't see each other. OnlyFans even remove the ability for them to read each other's comments. Um, girls have the ability to send mass messages that feel as though she only sent it to you. It's like the whole site is is designed um, to make the guy feel like he's the only person present on her page. And I think that this mm. is ended up being incredibly ingenious because how my free cams was sort of uh, my free cams was encouraging very rich men to tip quite a lot, but it was invisibly suppressing all of the lower earner men from participating because why would you pay ten dollars to make a girl kind of like smile at you when the next guy's going to come along and just beat you? But OnlyFans provided a platform for all of these lower earning men, lower tipping men, to be able to participate and feel more special. Um, and so I think that's why OnlyFans, one of the many reasons why OnlyFans is really shining right now, it like figured out like a new psychological uh, method of extracting uh, money for very little work on the part of the woman. Yeah. Do you use the, because OnlyFans also has a live streaming function where I believe you, other men can see because, you know, guys yes. can tip and then other guys can see that. Do you ever use that function on there? I have used it before. Um, I'm actually, I haven't checked recently, so it's possible there's updates that I'm not aware of. Um, but from my understanding, very few girls actually use this. Um, and it's also really buggy the last time I tried it. Maybe mm -hmm. they fixed it in the meantime, but it seemed like OnlyFans was not putting an emphasis on uh, making the live stream a thing. Maybe that's because it doesn't really serve them for the reasons that you just explained. Like guys are there to feel like they have that one-on-one -on -one direct conversation with you when that's evidently not the case in a live stream. Yeah, I'm actually not sure. So OnlyFans goes to one extreme with the separation of men from each other and my free cams or whatever uh, is, is the other extreme with the high whales. And I'm not sure actually if, if the middle is a dip, it gets possible some combination of the two would actually result with more money. Um, so I, I actually, I don't know if including the live streaming option decreases the total amount of income that OnlyFans makes. Hey guys, if you want to support my show, then you should think about joining my Patreon. At my Patreon, I offer all kinds of amazing perks in exchange for your financial support. From live streams of my interviews as they are happening, to bonus Q and A's, behind the scenes photos and videos of my shoots, plus cool merch like stickers, mugs, and hoodies, we have you covered. So go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered, and while you're at it, make sure that you click that subscribe button so you don't miss a single one of my new updates.